Aloha, and welcome to this first joint press conference, joint video press conference, in states and territories and the Commonwealth involved in the important issue of the Jones Act and how it uh, impacts on our taxpayers and consumers in each state. I'm Sam Sloan, the Hawaii State Senate Minority Leader, uh, here to welcome you. It's 1 p.m. in the afternoon here in Honolulu. We are broadcasting uh, from the Hawaii State Senate, uh, and we've got a number of uh, guests and individuals who are going to give their perspective on the importance of the Jones Act. Let me say very briefly that uh, for more than two decades, many of us in this community have been uh, involved and interested in this issue, how it affects us in terms of competition, uh, more importantly in consumer prices, and um, for a long period of time, there seemed to be a very difficulty, a difficult time in getting traction uh, because there were uh, people involved in the American maritime industry uh, that just plain said no, no discussion, no changes in the Jones Act. In the period of time in the last decade particularly, there's been more interest as prices have continued to rise, competition has fallen, and more and more people have understood the impact of the Jones Act on them and individual uh, jurisdictions. As I said, this is the, uh, the first, we call it the Jones Act multi-state international video state uh, conference, press conference, and we're going to get the perspective from uh, people in the state of Hawaii, uh, state of Alaska, uh, the territory of Guam, and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico all because all of our areas are specifically impacted by the Jones Act. Now, over the past decade, there have been lawsuits. There have been hearings at both the state and federal level. Um, there has been more information generated. For example, it's now known that the Hawaii cost of living, uh, primarily because of our additional shipping costs and the cost of the Jones Act, are now 49% higher than the U.S. mainland. And this is becoming unbearable. It's difficult for individuals, it's difficult for families, and it's difficult for small businesses as well. There have been different parts uh, of the Jones Act that have been explored uh, with seminars and workshops over the years, and there have been bills and resolutions addressed to the United States Congress for relief. There are different approaches to this, uh, one approach would be to abolish uh, the Jones Act altogether. Another would be for various uh, forms of reform. Uh, there are resolutions that are alive in the Hawaii State Senate and House this year that call upon the Congress to strike the provision that requires American shipbuilding. So what we're here today to do basically is to interact with one another, to join together because there is strength in numbers, to find out the commonality of interests that we have and to develop a strategy for having successful legislation in the future. At this time, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to uh, go to the 49th state and to uh, introduce uh, uh, State Senator John Cockhill. Senator? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Aloha. Senator Cockhill had to excuse himself. I'm Senator Dyson. And uh, we're glad for what we think you guys are doing. It has huge impact here in Alaska. The, uh, our, our state legislature put in statute in 1982 that the government is supposed to do, the governor is supposed to do everything he can to get us out of the Jones Act restrictions to uh, uh, American polls. And that was renewed by our legislature in 2008. So we are officially and in statute uh, on the record. Let me say for today that neither John nor I have the authority to speak for either the governor or the legislature, but I would be very surprised if there isn't virtually total support for what we believe you're doing. We are a maritime nation. You can almost think of us as another island uh, kind of separated by a foreign country with uh, a very poor land link, and we are supplied by ship and by airplanes, just like Hawaii is and the other the participants here. Plus, we have 
a more coastline than all of the of South 48, and most of the goods move by boat along the coast. So being able to avail ourselves to a, a, a huge savings from having foreign constructed ships is uh, very significant and would be a reduction in our freight rates and, uh, and so on. So we are thoroughly on board with the effort and uh, I too have to go to another responsibility, but uh, we ask respectfully that you keep us in the loop, count us as partners, and we'd be glad to work together <coughs> with you all on, on going further on this. Personally, I have a 100-ton Coast Guard license, spent a lot of time at sea, and uh, anticipate that uh, there'll be pushback from organized labor uh, on this issue as there has every time it come up on a national level. Uh, I'm glad to answer any questions, uh, but I won't be able to be here for the, the latter part of the discussion. Thank you. Just, just to confirm for the record, we're speaking with Senator Fred Dyson. That's correct, sir. And uh, we appreciate that. Uh, may I just ask, has there been any kind of uh, survey or uh, referendum in the state of Alaska on this uh, Jones Act issue? Negative. And as I assume it is for almost all of you, the general population is utterly ignorant of either the Jones Act or its implications for us. Ignorant other than the costs and the impact to them. Sorry? Uh, they're ignorant possibly of some of the technical details of the Jones Act, but not ignorant of the impact of the additional costs. They probably are ignorant of that too. Uh, <laughs> we have a, a job to do. We have a job to, explain, to do. Study and explain what the savings would be. Well, we welcome your partnership and we thank you for your participation. And unless there's any questions of Senator Dyson, we'll uh, free you to go on to your yeah, other responsibilities. Yes, Representative uh, Senator Ward. Dyson, I'm very impressed that you have put that in statute and I think you may be leading the, the group or the troops in that sense, but has it made any difference? Has having it codified uh, caused any more information, stir, or activities that gets closer to something that we're talking about today, i.e. an exemption? Yeah, I'm not hearing you clearly, but I think the answer is, to my knowledge, that there's nothing been organized and done except uh, some resolutions sent off and putting this in statute. Okay, thank you very much. Representative uh, Evans has a question. Uh, I hope uh, the weather is well up there in Alaska. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. Um, my question has to do with the unions. Um, clearly, this has always been an issue. Uh, the reason I believe that we're not forwarding this discussion is because of fear. And a lot of the fear is um, fear of what might change if we move down this path of either repealing or modifying the Joint Jones Act. Have you been in discussions with your union leaders in Alaska? I have not, but if you look back on the history of, of the Jones Act, it was a major effort to protect the workers at U.S. shipyards. and. Uh, uh, Obviously, for national defense reasons and others, we've got to preserve some U.S. shipbuilding capacity. And I do not believe that, in general, our union uh, workforce here, which is very large, will see that they have to join in brotherhood with the shipyard workers in the South 48 at the expense of Alaska's economic health. But that's a question that has not been asked nor resolved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Dyson, and let me just uh, reiterate that uh, not only are we having multiple uh, jurisdictions, but that this conference and this effort to reform the Jones Act is bipartisan, both in our state of Hawaii and also in other areas. So thank you once again, Senator Dyson, and we look forward to your active participation and partnership. We'd like to participate in the middle of the winter on your trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, you have a standing invitation to come and do that. Thank you. Thank you and aloha.
And now we're going to turn from uh, the state of Alaska uh, to the uh, Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Aloha, Senator Lopez. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for participating with us. Uh, did you want to uh, bring us up to date on the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico's uh, efforts in Jones Act reform? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, of all, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to all of you regarding our common concerns with the application of the Jones Act. In Puerto Rico for the past four months, I have been receiving meetings regarding the Senate of Puerto Rico resolution number 237 which orders an investigation about the economic impact of the maritime trade costs between Puerto Rico and the United States. Having the United States Government Accountability Office report Puerto Rico characteristics of the island maritime trade and the potential effects of the modifying the Jones Act as a start off for the investigation. I have come to knowledge that all of us have been very active concerning the federal maritime laws, the same worries that we all have at the application of the Jones Act are the same issues and the theories that each of our territories have in common. The establishment of the safe, of the safe restrictions which force our people to trade with ships built in the United States, beating the U.S. flags and using American crews between the nation ports of the island and be very much affected of, our, of all our economics through the years, as well as our citizens. There have been initiatives and waivers before, such as November, following the effects of Hurricane Sandy, in which the Secretary of Homeland Security Administration issued a temporary waiver on the John Sad in order to allow no John Sad oil tankers to transport oil from U.S. ports in the Gulf of Mexico, forced to provide additional fuel resources to the region. In such waiver have not been issued, it have resulted in an imminent unavailability of petroleum products, including gasoline, and treated the nation economic and national security. By this means, we can ask such waivers, but definitely what we need is a full extension to all application in U.S. territories and states for, for an, an antique and protectionist law that does not stand in today's independent work and economy. If we truly want to create jobs and boost our economy development, we need to eliminate the implementation of the Jones Act in Puerto Rico too. We will support President Obama's policy, public policy to create jobs, increasing exports, but we need to total ascension of Don Johnson to transform our island, our island, into a powerful, powerful transshipment destination. A studies made by prestigious organizations here in Puerto Rico and the United States, such as the World Economic Forum and the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, among others, reveal that the John Sand represent an obstacle for Puerto Rico economic development. Local economists said in public hearings that we can grow at least, at least 10% without the application of the Jones Act. All Puerto Rico commercial sector, as well as the industrials and small business, agree that we have to move from the Jones Act at Otherwise, we are losing great business opportunity hiding behind this obsolete law. Also, it is important to know that this is the first time in Puerto Rico Legislative Assembly we are considering to elevate this issue to the United Nations Organization. Once again, I congratulate all territories, fellow legislators, and the Hawaii Shipping Council for this extraordinary conference, which by my knowledge, it is the first time that we all come together to ask Congress to repeal a hundred years old law, and definitely for your cooperation regarding 
this important matter and the future economy of our islands, a future without trade restraints. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your willingness to cooperate uh, so that all of us can work together. And most importantly, the work that you have done about economic development and economic opportunities, if in fact we make changes to this law, I think that's extremely important. Uh, do my colleagues have questions? I have a question to the Senator. Sure. Senator, thank you for your presentation, your support. And I caught notice of one thing that you said. Did I hear correctly when you said you were going to bump this to the United Nations for their consideration? Did I hear correctly? United Nations is... Yes. How are you going to do that? Which group? And that sounds uh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, because, uh, the first time one of the uh, uh, purposes of the resolution is uh, first to uh, bring all the information that the GEO never put in the report. And the other purpose of the resolution too is going to the United Nations to the committee of the uh, United Nations that will deal especially with the situation of uh, civil rights because uh, we are seeking to elevate this to the United Nations, especially because uh, that jumps out, uh, convert to us a situation in the, because the Puerto Rico will not grow economically in some part. So we are trying to put this in the, in the, in the United Nations hands, also in the colonization committee, trying to explain to them that if you, if the Congress uh, put out the Jones Act in Puerto Rico, we will grow economically. So in, in some point, we are trying to, to put in the, in the table that maybe can be a situation of the civil rights and an economic issue that will eliminate to us another opportunities to, uh, as an island, to develop in the economic point. So um, we are trying to explain that if the Jones Act will not bring to us an opportunity to grow economically, uh, they, uh, United States, can uh, be in a position that is uh, against the United or uh, civil rights of the of the Puerto Rico citizens. So that because uh, some organizations here in Puerto Rico are uh, willing to go to United Nations to put this in table and said that maybe you are violating or you are trying to eliminate a, a purpose or alternative that will help us to grow as an island and you are against three of rights of the United of the uh, citizens of Puerto Rico too. Thank you and please keep us posted on how that progresses. Are there, Thank you. Are there any I other questions be. for the, the senator? I just two two closing remarks. Again, thank you so much for your participation, and we look forward to working closer with you. Uh, you should be aware that the Hawaii State Legislature, which is meeting in session now until May 1st, um, we uh, have uh, legislation that is passing that brings us even closer together in a working relationship with Puerto Rico. So uh, we expect that that is moving along in both the past the Senate and in the House. So thank you so much, Senator. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, Representative Jean Ward. Aloha mai kako. Buenos dias. Hafa uh, even though Guam can't hear me. Uh, <laughs> if you do, I, I expect to retur return of the same. Uh, but thank you for sharing your perspective on what otherwise we have in common as a plight. I, I really like the way that uh, Puerto Rico explained it as a, it's a growth stunter. I think we have to reach out to the unions and see how members of the unions are hurting as much as any other families that have to pay 100% differential on groceries and because we import 80%, 90% of everything that we have, we are paying more in paradise than any others and if, when the numbers and the education gets out, even though this has been 20 years 
that we've tried to educate people on the Jones Act. It just hasn't got traction. So this is the first international occasion. I want to commend you and thank you for bringing us on an international occasion to, to the state capitol to talk with our brothers and sisters in Guam and in Puerto Rico and Alaska, because together there's leverage. Right now, we are a minority of people trying to do something, and together we can leverage that. So uh, I'm glad to have been a part of this panel, and I hope we continue with it, and I hope the, the United Nations does give some leverage to what is in the making, and Alaska is a good example of having put it in statute. So, thank you. Thank you, Representative Ward. I'd like to hear from State Representative Cindy Evans. Cindy. Thank you. This year at the state legislature, we have many issues where we hear both sides of the debate, and it seems like we just define the line and we stay on one side or the other. Uh, the thing about the Jones Act, since I've been here, is that people tend to be on one side or the other. And that doesn't move us forward on the discussion of the Jones Act. Um, we end up getting, uh, again, this feeling of fear. Um, you know, we know what we know. We've had the Jones Act for years. Uh, a lot of people believe it's worked, so why are we even having that discussion? Then you have people say, why can't we grow the economy? You know, what is it out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Why can't we do a better job? And people say, well, the Jones Act might be able to help growth area and technology, manufacturing, whatever the arguments are. And you can, they both seem valid to me. Um, so my position as a state representative has been, why can't we have that discussion, have the unions at the table, um, have our leaders at the table, and figure out what could we do better for Hawaii so we can grow this economy? Uh, for me personally, when we had the liquid uh, natural, natural gas discussion here a few years back, it seemed like these big bulk ships that carried natural gas, uh, it might be a great way to lower the cost of energy uh, in Hawaii. So why not have the discussion about the Jones Act? Why not have the discussion about these specialized uh, ship, ships? Um, Today in the newspaper here in Hawaii, there was a, a, an article that um, because it may take so long to, to, to resolve this issue about getting the liquid natural gas bulk uh, huge ship into Hawaii that they're going to containerize uh, the liquid natural gas and bring it in containers. Um, is that effective? Is it going to end up raising the cost of energy again? Um, clearly, one of our mandates, I believe, coming to the legislature is get control over this cost of energy and get the cost down. Even that is just one mission. We should be talking about the Jones Act. Because we've been asked by the community across the whole state of Hawaii, why can't you get the cost of energy down? That in itself should have us at the table with the unions who have the working families who are paying these large costs of energy. They should be at the table with all of us saying, could the Jones Act, a modification to it, help us get the cost of energy down? That is, for me, the reason why I support at least the discussion and getting people back to the table talking about it. Again, um, when something has been around for as long as it's been around, there's always a point in time you want to say, why do we do what we do and continue to do it the same way? Should we do something different? I think with this energy mandate that we may want to consider doing something different. And I invite whoever's listening, and I'm really grateful that we have Guam and Puerto Rico who again are on islands that understand that the cost of doing business and the cost can be horrendous. And how do we get those costs down? That's our job, I think, to work on it. So I want to thank you for joining us today. And I can't see you, but... Uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate, really appreciate you joining us in the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Evans. And, and I think the point that you made is an important one. First of all, um, this issue, like many other issues, should not be mutually exclusive. And it shouldn't be a question of, uh, you know, winners and losers. We should be working towards a situation that, uh, as the senator in, in uh, Puerto Rico said, for economic development, uh, for uh, benefits to consumers, uh, and certainly we should be smart enough to find new ways of addressing these problems. So thank you for your input. We have two gentlemen that have been involved in the, the Jones uh, uh, Act issues. 
for many, many years uh, are directly involved now, and so I'd like to give each of them an opportunity to, to speak on the issue. First of all, Mr. Michael Hansen, who is the head of the uh, Hawaii Shippers Council, uh, has been an active advocate for Jones Act reform, has written many articles, uh, and represents a group who are directly affected by the costs imposed by Jones Act. Uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm pleased to be with uh, and join with and thank the Hawaii State Legislators gathered here today and those who introduced the four companion resolutions calling for Jones Act reform. I would also like to thank the legislators from Alaska and Puerto Rico who participated today. The Hawaii Shippers Council is an industry trade association representing those interests of the cargo owners who ship their merchandise in the Hawaii trade. The shippers, i.e. the cargo owners, are the customers of the shipping companies and they pay the freight. We fully support the intent of the resolutions to exempt the non-contiguous trades of Alaska, Guam, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico from the domestic build-up requirement of the Jones Act. The cost of building major commercial ships in the United States is now well documented to be more than five times that of constructing comparable ships in Japan and South Korea. Together with China, Japan and South Korea built more than 90% of the world's new ships over a thousand gross tons. Although there are approximately 38,000 self-propelled ships over a thousand gross tons in the world today, the U.S. domestic shipping trades face a scarcity of large self-propelled ships. This is especially critical to the interstate surface transportation in the non-contiguous trades where nearly 50% of the 90 ships in the Jones Act fleet over a thousand gross tons are employed. The eight major domestic shipbuilding yards in the United States have, construct, have constructed on average approximately two ships per year since the early 1990s. In comparison, Japan alone builds over 300 ships per year. These are large commercial ships for export. That does not include their domestic market. There is no shortage of major ships in the world, just in the Jones Act trades, due to the highly protectionist law. In comparison, other modes of transportation are allowed to use uh, equipment manufactured in foreign places, including air transportation and the trucking industries. For example, we've all probably been on an Airbus. Those were built in France. The extraordinarily high cost of shipbuilding and the artificial shortage of con commercial ships in the United States creates a narrow and highly concentrated domestic shipping market. The shortage of ships and the high cost of construction create significant barriers to entry into the Jones Act trades. Virtually any potential new entrant ship operator uh, is either unable or uh, un unable to afford or unwilling to acquire the necessary capital assets, namely U.S. built ships, at such unrealistically uh, inflated prices to challenge the incumbent companies. The very high barriers to entry create a market that is all but uncontestable by new entrants and insulates the incumbent operators from virtually any new competition. Although it seems counterintuitive, the Jones Act shipping industry supports the U.S. build requirement of the Jones Act even though it makes acquiring ships for domestic service so much more expensive. The Jones Act industry supports the build requirement because it protects their monopoly-like positions and wards away any meaningful competition. Because of their control of the domestic shipping market, the existing Jones Act shipping interests can pass the high cost of U.S. built ships along to their customers, the shippers who own the cargo, and ultimately the American consumers. And that is especially uh, hard-hitting on those residents in the non-contiguous jurisdictions that are completely reliant upon uh, 
inter uh, surface transportation for interstate commerce. The, highly, the High Jones Act shipping acquisition costs also provide greater absolute profits. This is especially true for the container ships operating in the common, operating common carrier in the non-contiguous trades. Their rates are nominally regulated by the U.S. Surface Transportation Board. However, their greater rate base uh, provides a greater absolute profit allowed under the regulatory standard for zone of reasonableness. It is time to align the domestic shipping operators in the non-contiguous trades with the rest of the world. It's time to remove the protectionist U.S. build requirement and compel the shipping operators to acquire their ships for, from far more efficient foreign sources. This is a realistic approach to bring real competition to the, to the non-contiguous trades and relief to the shippers and consumers. Thank you for the opportunity to address the group here. Thank you, Michael. Michael Hansen of the Hawaii Shippers Council, and we also want to thank Michael uh, for helping put this press conference together and for his many years of uh, working with the other areas of uh, Puerto Rico and, and Guam and Alaska, being a very uh, strong and factual advocate for reform. Uh, another gentleman who has been involved in this issue for a long period of time uh, and who is an, an expert on transportation uh, issues and the costs, uh, Mr. Cliff Slater. Cliff? Thank you, Sam. Uh, <clears throat> it's now almost 100 years uh, since the, since the, uh, it's now almost 100 years since the Jones Act was passed uh, with, the, with the idea of protecting uh, American maritime resources. Uh, we had at the time that legislation was passed, uh, we had one of the, that was the high point of the percentage of uh, large ships that the U.S. Uh, owned um, and operated, um, and, is, and it's declined steadily since since the passage of that legislation to the day where it's a ne negligible part of the world's transportation. Um, it is. Obviously, time to revisit <clears throat> that whole issue, and uh, there there are just two reasons that there is political support for uh, for the Jones Act. Um, number one um, is the original idea of supporting uh, American shipyards and the American shipping industry, but given now that. Uh, American ships are just not uh, uh, economically viable. Um, that that is no longer really supporting American shipbuilding industry, as as you heard from the previous speaker. The two 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 ships a year doesn't cut it compared to to what's coming out of South Korea and Japan. <clears throat> the other re the other reason, and I did a lot of research. Of, this about 10 years ago uh, on campaign contributions to, to the supporters of the Jones Act, and it's very significant. It, 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 that then was, uh, then, then was the, 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 the Cabotage Task Force, now the American Maritime Partnership, and I've no doubt that it's exactly the same. It is one of the major contributors uh, to, to political contributions and one of the main reasons that, the, uh, that many are reluctant to vote against it. Um, I can understand, I think we can all understand that uh, that money is the mother's milk of politics, but on the other hand, uh, as somebody pointed out, the union members in, in the aggregate are being hurt far more by the Jones Act than are uh, those few union members who are the beneficiaries of it. Um, so the, all in all, to, to those remarks together, what has been said earlier, it, it, it's time, really time now, to rethink the Jones Act and at the very least uh, allow foreign-built ships into the trade. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff Slater.
Uh, regrettably, it does not look like we're going to be able to make the connection uh, with the territory of Guam. We had uh, State Senator Roy Respicio and State Senator V. Anthony Ada, uh, and possibly we can get statements from them uh, at a later time. By the way, we will have press statements available after this broadcast uh, from uh, those that participated, but we have a few minutes extra now, so I'd like to ask uh, my colleagues or, or any of the two gentlemen if they would like to add anything else. A question to the two experts. Certainly. Uh, are the numbers correct when you said there are only 90 out of the 38,000 vessels that are above 1,000 uh, gross tons? Right. We have 90 uh, U.S. vessels that, out of 38,000 in the world. Exactly. I mean, that's less, that's two there, tenths of one percent. I didn't Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very tiny percentage. It's minuscule. Right. What there, was it there, we have an artificial scarcity of large commercial ships in the domestic trades. And that's just created by the build requirement of the Jones Act. There is, no, in fact, no scarcity of ships in the world, just in the United States. <laughs> we're certainly not a rule Britannia when you've got uh, two tenths of one percent of the ships. Cliff, were you going to add something about what? Well, I just want, just in comparison, in, in uh, 1920, when I think it's 20, 1920, when the Jones Act was passed, yeah. we had 21% of the, of the world's shipping. Wow. Good question. Representative Evans? Um, how uh, are the ships in the world, how many um, are owned by U.S. citizens or U.S. investors? Do you think that predominantly the ships of the world are owned by other foreign investors and countries? Uh, yes, the uh, ships are predominantly owned by other investors and in, in, uh, in the world, non-American. Uh, the reason for that is that up, uh, up until the mid-80s, about 20% of the world's fleet was, in fact, owned by U.S. interests. And that was referred to as the uh, U.S.-owned international flag fleet. That um, ownership uh, what uh, was uh, in 1986, I think it was the, um, the tax reform bill, changed the status of the income from those ships uh, and taxed it on a domestic basis. And at that point, most of these ship owners who were American then divested themselves of those ships. This was uh, a tax that uh, the unions were advocating for, and they thought by taxing the foreign flag ship income that Americans were earning, that they could force those owners to reflag their ships US. And in fact, what happened is that they couldn't compete in the world market with this onerous tax and requirements on them, and so they simply divested their ships. And this actually uh, hurt U.S. national defense quite a lot because the, the uh, military sea lift command had depended upon these ships uh, for additional sea lift capacity in the event of a, of a war or some kind of contingency. You know, you know I, th I think that's a real important thing to, because obviously every time you see literature and discussion on the Jones Act, people are always talking about defense. Um, and, and capability of making sure we get food to Hawaii or we get toilet paper to Hawaii or, you know, they're always bringing that, that up. And so that's why I asked because, again, it's about security and predictability. Sure. Yeah, then, uh, on the national security side, there's three points. One is the sea lift capacity that refers to the ability to charter ships to move cargo to overseas contingencies. Then there's the shipbuilding industrial base, and that refers to the capacity of the U.S. shipyards to build new ships in the time of national emergency, or even to build them on an ongoing basis. The problem with that side is that the shipbuilding capacity is so limited now and is so expensive that not only can't commercial ship owners acquire as many ships as they might want to, but also it's wrecking the Navy budget because the cost of each ship has gone up so high 
that the Navy is ending up not being able to build as many ships as they want to. So we have a critical problem with U.S. shipbuilding. On the sea lift side, there is in existence a fleet called the U.S. Flag International Trade Fleet. It's comprised of 89 ships, and those ships are all foreign built, U.S. flag. About half of them are foreign owned, and they can only trade in the international trade. But the U.S. government subsidizes those ships and gives them preference cargoes. The third national defense uh, argument is that we need a pool of trained seamen for national emergency. And, you know, it's, uh, these arguments don't hold up very well when you start to analyze them. And so the national defense argument for the Jones Act is really uh, not a very strong one if you look at it point by point. Uh, most of the very few Jones Act ships ever get uh, used for sea lift purposes. Um, have you gone to Congress? Have you testified? Have you had any contact with our congressional delegation or gone to, has there been any delegation from Hawaii that you've been involved in that has gone to Washington, D.C.? Um, I did testify in uh, Congress in, I think it was 1996. Uh, that was a long time ago. That was at a time when there was a guy by the name of Rob Cortell and the Jones Act Reform Coalition, active. I think Sam and, and yeah. Gene both remember them. Yes. Um, and uh, he was able to push Jones Act reform to the point where the House, U.S. House, actually held hearings on the Jones Act. But nothing much really happened after that. Uh, the congressional delegation, uh, Senator Inouye, of course, was a very strong, staunch advocate of the Jones Act. Um, the <clears throat> current delegation, uh, have all made statements in support of the Jones Act. Uh, so I don't see any real change coming there. Uh, the delegate from Puerto Rico, uh, Pedro Perlusi, is uh, supportive of Jones Act reform, and so is the delegate from Guam, uh, Mrs. Ms. Mrs. Bordal. So there's some um, movement there, and uh, we'll have to see what happens in the election in Alaska where Mark Begich, the Democrat, is up for re-election. And they're made, uh, the two Republican challengers, including the current lieutenant governor, are both supportive of Jones Act reform. Okay. Thank you. And our senator from Puerto Rico mm -hmm. is, is still online. Did you have any other comments or questions you wanted to make? Uh, a point here, just following the Michael Hansen uh, testimony. Uh, for us, the studies that have been done already in Puerto Rico uh, are telling us that uh, mostly all the vessels that come to Puerto Rico are, are four years old. So the point of the national defense is is, on, is something that is uh, already eliminating uh, from the purpose of the Jones Act. Uh, some of the other studies have been described to that uh, an accession uh, have been can be done because we have it before a session for the cruises especially mm -hmm. and we and because we get an accession of the cruises the, the the bill and the crew especially in the cruises uh Puerto Rico have been uh providing with a grow in the in economic part of the tourism so Puerto Rico have already uh experience in a session so for us this kind of example uh, help us to um, deal with a new session that can be done to Puerto Rico uh, mostly in the bill uh, from the bill session because we think that uh, if the first step is the is to try to get a session in the bill in the bill point that would help us a lot, especially for the G G and Ls and uh, and the program too. So because we wanna uh, work together with you is because we uh, think that together we can get to Congress 
or even we can go to uh, to Medemarat to express and describe how the session will help us to uh, obtain a better economic growth and help our citizens to get jobs, to get what injustice have, and especially uh, the jobs that we need now in economic crisis that we have here in Puerto Rico. So for us, this uh, opportunity is very important, and this is for opportunity expressed to us that we can do something together uh, for the citizens of all our countries and for Puerto Rico too. I really appreciate all your support uh, about the John side. Well, thank you so much, Senator. Thank you for your participation and involvement, and we can pledge that we are going to work closer together and find other ways of doing things. You know, this discussion has been interesting because we talk about the Jones Act in terms of protection and who it's actually protecting. And obviously it's not protecting the economies of our various jurisdictions, nor is it protecting the consumers. And ultimately it's not protecting the very people it's supposed to protect because we don't have more American shipbuilding. So uh, the steps that we can take, and there are different paths for reform or change, uh, we'll try to, to take those together. So we certainly appreciate it. Uh, your participation today. And I want to thank everyone uh, who helped make this possible. We did have a glitch. We're sorry we did not get uh, uh, Guam with us. It's probably too many tree snakes, brown tree snakes in the, in the wiring. But we'll try to get that uh, fixed up and hopefully we'll do this again. We want to thank the Office of the Senate President uh, here in the Hawaii State Legislature for facilitating uh, these uh, conversations. And to my colleagues, uh, Representative Cindy Evans from the island of Hawaii, uh, from uh, Representative Gene Ward, Michael Hansen of the Hawaii Shippers Council, and uh, Cliff Slater, and most of all to you who participated. Again, a reminder that uh, we will have uh, press statements from the various jurisdictions, and we want to thank uh, Senator uh, Rosanna Leon and also Senator Fred Dyson from the state of Alaska, uh, and for the folks in, in Guam, uh, we will be in closer contact. Uh, it is a situation where we basically have to either beg or show our united front before the United States Congress. Uh, we have opportunities though, and I know a lot of people have gotten discouraged over the years, but there are things that we can do. And following up on, on Representative uh, Evans' uh, ideas, we definitely need more discussion, we need to bring more people to the table, and find out, uh, in fact, what things that we can work on together to, to make these changes. So uh, thank you all. Uh, Rep, uh, Senator Dyson, Fred Dyson of Alaska, had said initially that he thought that the people in Alaska possibly were ignorant of the issues and maybe even of the consumer impact, which tells us that education always is at the foundation of any issue that we talk about and, and do. So it's. Uh, for us uh, in elective office and, and those of you that are particularly interested in this issue to see what we can do, but we'll do it together. So from the state legislature and the state senate in, in Hawaii, we say aloha, mahalo. Thank you so much for your participation. Aloha. Have a great day.